Now, as we sort of as we began our service, we kind of put the question out there: um, what 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 comes first in the Christian life, grace or faith? Grace or faith? And uh, we'll read through this chapter here and and see see what comes out from God's word. Let God's word speak and. Whether we understand everything, that's okay if we don't, but there are things that are really clear, and so that'll help us. We make steps in that regard. So Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to start reading with verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I recognize real quick who your blessing there. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he, what? Oh, chose us in him when? Whoa, man. Chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Having... That was a big word, isn't it? What's that word there? Predestined. My goodness. That's kind of a weird one, isn't it? That's in the Bible. There you go. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and and which are on uh, on earth in him. In him we also have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, to the praise of his glory. The Lord had his own blessing of the reading, hearing, and understanding of his word to us tonight. Well, we're going to be looking at two um, individuals in the Reformation, and one of them is a name by, um, his surname is Calvin or John Calvin. And the other one is Zwingli. It was really hard for me to pronounce his first name. It it was sorry, but that's what he's known by. And uh, both of these guys were at work in Switzerland. And I don't know, Doug, you got that picture. You can maybe pop that up. That's, there's, I've, I've been to Geneva some years back. I went and it was really cool because I, I got to go, and you can actually see Bibles that were handwritten. This is before the printing press. And I have to be honest, when I saw them, what I expected was something that looked like my handwritten notes, which is all kind of like all over the place, right? That's what I expected to see. But these were absolutely incredible. These looked like works of art. All the lines were drawn. You could even see some of the pencil lines actually done. You know, the big kind of cursive letters and the gold inlay. I was, I wasn't, I was really shocked, I have to say, because sometimes we think of old being sloppy. Yeah, anything that was written before a certain time, we think of it that it wasn't, this is as far from the truth as you could get. And to see copies of the Bible so old that uh, that are that are so magnificently laid out. It really it it shook. I you know I I didn't expect it. And you can go to the museums there in Geneva and see these for yourself. I was quite amazed. And I remember standing there as a, as a young pastor standing before this monument. And these were men who were used. And this affected all of Europe, all of the UK, 
Scotland and, and Wales, Ireland and, and England and you, all, all throughout Europe. And these weren't old guys. I know the pictures look like they're old guys there. When they began, they were in their 20s. And they stood their ground. They wouldn't give way. They stood on God's word, and the world shook. God still does things like that today. He still does things like that today. And he's looking for hearts that are his, that he can take hold of and shake them. And shake them. And then when nothing else can be shaken, he uses them to shake them. Tonight we're going to look at these two lives that were used by God during that period of time. And again, it's a little bit educational, and so uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll appreciate it. I hope you will. And then we're going to look at a couple of things, the implications of some of these things, even for us uh, today. All right? Okay. The Reformation in 16th century Europe moved forward on many fronts. Sometimes it moved forward in secret to avoid detection. Other times it moved forward in great cathedrals with dynamic preachers. It also advanced in quiet scholarship and the rediscovery of the Bible. It advanced among both peasants and privileged. It sometimes advanced in fierce theological debate and other times in violent combat. Today we look at the Reformation in Switzerland where it advanced in all those ways. We will look at its two most noted leaders Ulrich Zwingli at Zurich, and John Calvin in Geneva. Zwingli was a mountain man, born on New Year's Day in 1484, just a few years before Columbus discovered the New World. Zwingli's family lived in the village of Wildhouse, about 40 miles outside of Zurich. This is his childhood home. His father was a mountain farmer and bailiff. Zwingli had seven brothers and six sisters. Young Ulrich was a gifted musician, able to play six instruments. He would go from here to be educated at Basel, Vienna, and Bern. And then in 1506, at age 22, he was ordained in the Catholic Church and appointed parish priest in the Swiss community of Glarus. As a young priest, Zwingli accompanied the Swiss troops to the Battle of Marignano in Italy in 1515, an experience that marked him for life. The Swiss regularly hired themselves out as mercenary soldiers to other countries and even to the Pope. Zwingli saw over 6,000 Swiss young men killed at Marignano. He was outraged. He turned against the mercenary service. We're selling blood for gold, he railed. We're sending our young to be slaughtered. The Swiss economy depended on hiring out soldiers, so Zwingli's message wasn't popular. It cost him his church at Glarus. So he became priest at Einsilden, a busy Swiss pilgrimage center with a popular shrine to the Virgin Mary. Here he began to have growing doubts about Catholic practices. And here he experienced another personal turning point. Zwingli met the great humanist scholar Erasmus, who came out with his Greek New Testament in 1516. Zwingli bought it and devoured it. He taught himself Greek. Nothing but God shall prevent me from acquiring Greek, he said, not for the sake of fame, but for the sake of the Holy Scriptures. He copied Paul's epistles in Greek and carried them with him wherever he went and even memorized them. Here's a sample page where you see Zwingli's extensive notes in the margins. This intensive study of the Bible made him question Catholic doctrine even more. Zwingli knew about Luther and the ferment he was causing in Germany, and now Independently, Zwingli was coming to many similar conclusions. On New Year's Day, 1519, his 35th birthday, 
Zwingli became people's priest at the Grossminster or the Great Cathedral in Zurich. He was now a man obsessed with the Bible, so instead of following the prescribed text of the lectionary, he took the Gospel of Matthew and started preaching straight through the book. That was a bold move in that day. First year at Zurich, the city was struck by the dreaded plague. Zwingli was away recovering from illness. Against advice, he rushed back to attend to his people. You must help me. He contracted the plague and suffered Please three agonizing months. One-third of Zurich's 9,000 citizens died during that plague. It marked still another turning point for Zwingli. Now, in a deeper way, he knew of God's grace and the meaning of pastoral compassion. At the same time, his questioning of Rome continued. Zwingli had received a yearly payment from the Pope. He now refused that income. In his sermons, Zwingli directly challenged Catholic teachings he could not find in the Bible, such as indulgences, purgatory, the position of Mary, and the sacrifice of the Mass. He held the people of Zurich spellbound. One listener said, he felt as if lifted up by the hair and suspended in space. A curious episode proved pivotal. At Froschauer's print shop, the men worked late one evening preparing for the Frankfurt Book Fair. They were hungry and ate sausages during Lent, thereby breaking Lenten fasting rules. As one historian described it, that was like desecrating the flag would be for us today. Zwingli, instead of condemning this action, wrote a pamphlet supporting it. His gap with Rome was widening. Then Zwingli married. He had petitioned his bishop for permission. It was refused. So he married anyway, a widow, Anna Reinhardt. She brought three children to their marriage. They would also have four more of their own. Zwingli continued his studies and circulated his Reformation views. But this was not an age of religious pluralism. There was one church. Zwingli, like Luther in Germany, was going against centuries of tradition. His teachings could only provoke intense controversy. The Zurich City Council convened a public disputation on January 29, 1523, to debate his views. Representatives came from the Bishop of Constance and the surrounding region. Zwingli presented 67 Reformation articles. The council backed Zwingli and decreed that he and other pastors in the region were to preach nothing but what can be proved by the Holy Gospel and the pure Holy Scriptures. As a result, drastic changes were implemented in Zurich. The Mass was rejected. Instead of familiar golden chalices, simple and unadorned wooden cups and plates were now used for communion. Instead of a sacrifice in which the bread and wine were transubstantiated into the body and blood of Christ, as the Roman Church taught, the Church at Zurich now believed Christ was spiritually, not physically, present to believers who approached him in true faith. Zurich rejected monastic vows and the government took over the monasteries. Their goods were used to take care of the needy, their buildings changed into schools and hospitals. There was a daily distribution of food to those in need. The sick, widows, and orphans were provided public support. The reformers insisted that with a change of beliefs, there also had to come a change in behavior, not only personal, but social as well. There were to be no beggars in Zurich. Those who needed work were provided jobs. In a cleansing of the temple, visible reminders of Catholic worship were taken down. Zwingli and the council were not directly involved at first, but later approved the removal of Catholic elements not found in the Bible. A major crisis for Zwingli developed from among his most gifted students. They rejected infant baptism as unbiblical and rebaptized themselves as adults. For this, they were called Anabaptists. The city council held public debate and rejected their Anabaptist views. These Anabaptists would neither submit nor leave. 
So on January 5, 1527, the city council drowned Anabaptist leader Felix Muntz. Against the waters of baptism he sinned, they said, so by water shall he die. Felix was only the first of this new movement to be killed for their then radical beliefs. It's now October 1529. Zwingli rides to a meeting of vast strategic importance in Germany. The Reformation was spreading in Europe. It was a threat that could no longer be ignored by Rome. Could the Zwingli Protestants in Switzerland and the Luther Protestants in Germany establish a united front against the gathering Catholic resistance? Philip of Hesse convened the Marburg Colloquy at his castle and brought Luther and Zwingli to meet face to face. They took up 15 issues. Amazingly, they agreed on 14. They disagreed on the Eucharist and how Christ's presence was to be understood. They both rejected Catholic teaching but couldn't reconcile their own differences. Thus, the Lord's Supper given by Jesus to unite his followers became the issue over which these two separated. Zwingli's reform had spread mostly to the urban areas in Switzerland. The rural areas remained mostly Catholic. Each formed an alliance. They saw each other as a grave threat. Both sides organized for conflict. It was the beginning of over 100 years of religious wars in Europe between Protestants and Catholics. The opposing troops met in raging battle at Koppel, south of Zurich. Each side was convinced its own security and the truth of the Christian faith was at stake. Ironically, Zwingli, who had opposed mercenary service, now accompanied the Zurich troops into this civil war. Zwingli's men were outnumbered three to one. They put forth a stubborn resistance, but they were no match for their stronger opponents. Zurich lost over 500 lives, including Ulrich Zwingli. It was October 11, 1531. This memorial marks the place where Zwingli fell. His last words, they may kill the body, but they cannot kill the soul. His enemies quartered his body, then burned it. And then they mixed his ashes with the ashes of swine and threw them to the wind. But Zwingli's work was irreversible in Zurich. His reforms were advanced by his able associate, Heinrich Bullinger. Another major Reformation center in Switzerland was Geneva. The key leader there was the Frenchman, John Calvin. He would become as controversial as Zwingli, but for quite different reasons. John Calvin was born July 10th 1509 in the small French town of Noyon, about 70 miles north of Paris. This house, now a Calvin museum, is where he was brought up. Calvin never really knew his mother. She died when he was a small boy. His father was a prominent lawyer with close connections to the local bishop, so his father acquired two chaplaincies for Calvin when he was only 12. The income from these chaplaincies would provide him the best education available and young Calvin was marked to become a priest. His preparation for the priesthood brought him to study at the great University of Paris. It was a demanding environment that drew out Calvin's intellectual brilliance. Here he adopted strict personal habits he would maintain the rest of his life, eating little, sleeping less, and studying long. But Calvin's plan to be a priest was rudely interrupted when his father sent him away to study law instead. Later, Calvin returned here to Paris, not only as a lawyer, but as a young man seriously considering the Reformation teachings that were stirring up all of Europe. Calvin's friend, Nicholas Kopp, gave an inaugural address at the University of Paris on November 1st, 1533. It boldly set forth Reformation ideas that the French authorities would not tolerate. Calvin's association with Kopp was well known and both were forced to flee Paris. Calvin escaped through a window disguised as a vine dresser and slipped out of town. Calvin, now a fugitive, walked to Angoulême, about 270 miles south of Paris. Here he found refuge. 
and here his Reformation convictions deepened. Calvin stayed in the home of his friend and fellow Reformation sympathizer, Louis du Tillet. During this period, he had a conversion experience that now planted him firmly within the Reformation movement. Years later, he described that experience. Since I was so obstinately devoted to the superstitions of the papacy, that it was only with the utmost difficulty that I could be drawn out of such deep mire, God, by a sudden conversion, subdued my mind and made it teachable, for, considering my age, it was far more hardened than it should have been. Calvin now had to weigh the cost of following the path of the Reformers. He knew it would cost him a promising career in France, but there was no turning back. He resigned the chaplaincies he had been given as a youth, forsaking a guaranteed income from the Roman Church. He was ready now for whatever God called him to do. At this stage, Calvin could only assume that this would mean using his now obvious gifts as a scholar. Calvin, at age 22, had already established his reputation as a humanist intellectual by his commentary on the De Clementia by the classic Roman writer Seneca. But now, Calvin was consumed with the scriptures. He prepared a manual for the reformed Christian, his Institutes of the Christian Religion. The first edition was published in 1536 when Calvin was only 26 years old. It would become the most substantial theological work of the Reformation. It is still widely published and studied today. Calvin hoped that his institutes would so convincingly explain the Reformed faith that persecution against Protestants in France would stop. But Protestants continued to be hunted down and executed in France. Calvin and his colleagues had to meet in secret. This is a cave near Portier where they would come to meet for secret worship and celebration of the Lord's Supper. Here's a fascinating artifact from those secret meetings. This communion chalice was assembled in pieces so it could be disguised. The pots screwed together after the worshipers were safely secluded. This is their miniature two-inch tall copy of the Psalms. It was pinned up and hidden in someone's hair to be taken to their secret meetings. Calvin's life took a decisive turn in 1536 when he came here and crossed the Rhone River into Geneva, Switzerland. Calvin never planned to come here, and Calvin's way of thinking, we might say, he got sideswiped by God's providence. Here's what happened. Calvin was on his way to Strasbourg in Germany, intending to live the quiet life of a scholar. But fighting between the Holy Roman Empire and France blocked the direct route to Strasbourg, causing Calvin to detour here through Geneva. He planned to stay one night. It ended up 25 years. Geneva had only declared itself in favor of the Reformation a month or so before Calvin came by here. The leader of the Reform, the fiery William Farrell, pleaded with Calvin to stay. Calvin refused, so Farrell scared the life out of him. He threatened that God's curse would be upon Calvin if he did not stay and help when the need was so urgent. Calvin said later, I was so terror-struck that I gave up the journey I had undertaken. So Calvin took up residence in this house, not far from the church of St. Pierre, where Calvin was appointed as pastor, or more precisely, lecturer in Holy Scripture. On May 21, 1536, just weeks before Calvin arrived in Geneva, the city council had officially adopted the Reformation. They decreed the city would henceforth live according to the gospel and the word of God, without any more masses, statues, idols, or other papal abuses. From his pulpit here at St. Pierre, Calvin explained the Bible book by book, and he wasted no time seeking to implement the city council's mandate. Within his first year here, he drew up articles for organizing this new Reformation church and a catechism for teaching the faith to the citizens. Calvin insisted that the biblical faith was more than just doctrines to be believed, but was a moral way of life to be lived. Some of the Genevan citizens didn't like this. They thought this outsider Frenchman expected too much, and resistance to Calvin built quickly. 
One named his dog after Calvin. Others sent their dogs nipping at his heels. He was verbally assaulted in public. Obscene songs were sung about him in the taverns. Guns were fired outside his house to frighten him. Rarely in the history of Christianity has a church ever had a pastor so gifted, and rarely has a pastor ever endured such abuse from his own church. Things came to a head in a dispute over the Lord's Supper. The city council made certain demands. Calvin and Farrell refused to serve communion. Neither side would give in. This is the city hall today in Geneva, just as it was in Calvin's day. Here, in April of 1538, the city officials decided they'd had enough of John Calvin and William Farrell. They ordered them out of the city and gave them three days to leave. For Calvin, expulsion from Geneva was a relief. Now, at last, he could devote his life to his studies away from the tension in Geneva. But Martin Busa in Strasbourg, taking a page out of Farrell's book of persuasion, convinced Calvin he must obey the calling of God and become pastor of the French Protestant refugees in that city. It was here that Calvin married a widow, Idelette de Boer, who brought two children to their marriage. The couple would have one child of their own, who died when only a few days old. With Calvin out of Geneva, the distinguished Catholic Cardinal Sadoletto wrote to the Geneva leadership, trying to allure the city back to Rome. The Geneva officials asked Calvin to compose a reply on their behalf. Calvin wrote his masterful reply to Sadoletto. He may have wondered later if he had done too good a job, because the Geneva City Council decided they needed Calvin and Farrell after all, and invited them to take up leadership again in their city. Farrell again badgered Calvin that he had a calling before God to go back and finish his work at Geneva. Calvin's reply, Whenever I call to mind the wretchedness of my life there, my very soul must shudder at any proposal for my return. I would rather die a hundred deaths than again take up that cross. But on Tuesday, September 13, 1541, three and a half years after they had been kicked out, Calvin and Farrell returned to a triumphant welcome as spiritual leaders at Geneva. Calvin went to his pulpit and picked up his preaching at the same place in the Bible where he had left off without even mentioning the banishment. Calvin stayed for another 23 years until his death. During that time, it is no exaggeration to say that from Geneva, Calvin decisively influenced the future course of Christianity in Western civilization. Under Calvin, Geneva became known as a woman's paradise because of the laws enacted that punished husbands who abused their wives. Also under Calvin, Geneva's population doubled Students flocked in to study under Calvin. Refugees from religious persecution poured in to what was becoming known as the renowned Free City of Europe. One who came, an Englishman exiled by Bloody Mary, Bishop John Bale, said, Geneva seemeth to me to be the wonderful miracle of the whole world. So many from all countries come together, as it were, to a sanctuary, joined only with the yoke of Christ, and they live so lovingly and friendly. The leader of the Reformation in Scotland, John Knox, came to Geneva and reported it to be the most perfect school of Christ since the apostles. During his lifetime and ever since, Calvin has been heralded by friends as one of the greatest teachers ever. On the other hand, his numerous critics then and now vilify him as nothing short of tyrannical and the personification of evil. Two of the most frequently cited criticisms against him are, Calvin came up with a teaching that God predestined some to heaven and others to hell, and Calvin burned Servetus because he disagreed with him. Yes, Calvin did teach predestination, but he did not by any means invent the doctrine. He followed a history of orthodox interpretation that includes Luther, Aquinas, Augustine, even the Apostle Paul. At the same time, Calvin preserved an understanding of free will and human responsibility that is far less deterministic than much of modern psychology. Michael Servetus was burned at the stake in Geneva during Calvin's time, and Dr. Francis Higman, director of the Institute for Reformation Studies at the University of Geneva, explains why.
Now, Servetus denied that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, and that was heresy in the 16th century in anybody's book. And heresy of that order in almost anybody's book in the 16th century was punishable by death. Servetus had, in fact, already been condemned to death by the Catholic, Roman Catholics in France. And it was only because they were so careless they let him escape from prison that they did not, in fact, burn him themselves. And then he came to Geneva. Why? Because he wanted to convert Calvin which is a very extraordinary point of view. He was slightly crazy, as well as being an amazing genius in his own right. And he arrived in Geneva, and the problem was, what, what do you now do? Calvin recognized him. Does he allow this mad heretic to go free? Or, in that case, it looks as if we're more easy on heresy than, than even the papists. So there was a sort of um, wheels within wheels. He got himself into an abominable situation where, in fact, there was no alternative but to press for a condemnation. The other thing, of course, is it wasn't Calvin who condemned him. Calvin had no political authority in this city. He wasn't even a citizen until 1559. Um, he could ask the city authorities to take action, and the city authorities themselves took action, consulted the other churches in Switzerland and the other governments in Switzerland, and practically everybody said, yes, it is your responsibility to punish this heretic. And the city government condemned Servetus to burning, and it was a sort of horrible inevitability about the whole thing. Calvin's influence extended far beyond Geneva during his lifetime and ever since. His workload was staggering. He preached daily, produced commentaries on just about every book of the Bible, continually expanded his institutes, wrote dozens of devotional pamphlets, carried on a vast international correspondence, and trained and sent out hundreds of pastors and missionaries. He did all this while constantly suffering from poor health, including migraine headaches. Calvin's motto summed up his life promptly and sincerely in the service of God. And his theology was perhaps best summed up in the words of the Dutch theologian and prime minister, Abraham Kuyper. There is not one square inch of this entire universe of which Christ, the sovereign Lord of all, does not say, this belongs to me. Calvin died May 27, 1564, at the age of 54. We don't know where Calvin is buried because he left specific instructions that he be buried in an unmarked grave. Calvin wanted to make sure that his burial site would never be venerated as a shrine. However, this Reformation monument in the University Park was erected in the early 1900s to commemorate Calvin and his vast international influence. A 15-foot tall Calvin stands among other Reformation leaders with whom he was associated. But there is a living memorial to this man who never wanted to stay here in Geneva. Today, Geneva is the home to the World Alliance of Reformed Churches. The Alliance represents the spiritual descendants of John Calvin. Fifty million people in more than 80 countries. Did you find that okay? A bit heady? Do you follow it? Yeah, who John Calvin is and who Zwingli is. And uh, that whole teaching, see, as a church here, um, whether or not you understand it in all of its fullness or not, um, we hold to what you would call Reformed doctrine in regards to salvation that God is a sovereign Lord in regards to who he saves, how he saves, and how he deals with it. Yeah. I believe very strongly in um, Ephesians chapter 1 lays out those teachings very clearly. So let me go back to that initial question that I asked you. Which comes first in the life of the believer? Grace 
or faith? How many would say uh, grace? Yeah. Oh, wow, it's pretty, pretty, oh, I guess I've done a fairly good job in helping you to understand. Praise God. The thing is, is that sometimes people think it's my faith. My faith comes first. The problem is, is that the human heart is darkened by sin. And when it comes to it, the Bible says, Jesus said it in John chapter 3, that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. They don't want to come to the light lest their deeds be exposed. And so what has to happen in, inside the human heart, there has to be a work of the Spirit. Without realizing it, and many of us don't understand this, that when it comes to Calvin, because he rejected, and it was quite clear, most of the Reformers, but Calvin Petit, that they rejected a lot of the um, ritualistic ideas of how someone would get saved. Do you know what happens to the ministry of the Holy Spirit? His work actually gets exalted. Because if it's no longer my going and taking communion that brings me salvation, it's no longer my work and my effort that saves me, it's no longer even my faith, in, in a sense, in the initiation that brings me to Christ, it's the work of the Spirit. So you could say in one sense that Calvin was one of the first charismatic uh, emphasis in regards to his teaching because he had to venerate and move up in that sense in a reality of work of the work of the Spirit who is the one who initiates salvation in the life of the believer. Because it's the Holy Spirit who comes to convict us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. It says, and the Lord Jesus said that in the book of John. When, when it comes to it, that the Holy Spirit doesn't come and ask you first, can I convict you of sin, righteousness, and judgment, does he? He does it of his own accord. Why does he do it? Well, why does he want to? Ah, so now we go back even before we're born, according to the one song, he chose us when we were, when we were still in our mother's womb. Let's go back before the foundation of the world, before time itself comes into existence. In the mind of God, he has, he has a purpose set up and he decisively says, this one will be mine. And he sets his eye and heart on his saints. If you're his tonight, it's because before the foundation of the world, God in his grace lovingly said, you, by name, are going to be mine. And there was nothing in hell or earth or sky that was going to stop him from bringing you to himself. Not even your sinful rebellion. Not even your wayward choices. Because he would corner you in his love and bring you to repentance. And your heart would change. A godly sorrow would come over you. In spite of you being sinful to the core, he would come and regenerate you. Make you alive. Then you want something. You're searching and you're looking and, and you find that you want to belong to Christ. And then you can see in Him that He's the Savior and He opens your eyes to that truth. And you cry out to Him, surrendering your life to Him and confess Him as Lord. And that which He saves, He keeps. In the book of John, I believe it's chapter chapter 6, it's there's some quite powerful verses there. Let's go there for just a moment tonight. Let's pick up our reading from verse um, 35, John 6. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I have said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father, what? Gives me. So who gives who to whom? So you're a gift from the Father to the Lord Jesus. See, we think that salvation is a gift to me. Do you realize that you're a gift from the Father to the Son? All that the Father gives me. 
right, shall come to me. And he who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I say to you, you have seen me, and you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me. Of all that he has given me, I should lose what? Nothing. So in other words, that his grace is sufficient to keep me all the way to the very end. He's able. It's not my strength or his, my strength or my effort. Whose grace is it? It's his. It's his strength. I will lose none that the Father has given me. But I should raise him up, raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews then complained about him, saying that he is the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Do not murmur among yourselves. Listen to this. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me. Whoa, that's really intense, isn't it? No one can come to me. Actually, those words there mean no one has power to come. Why? Because you're bound in your own nature. You're bound. You're dead in your trespasses and sins. So how are you saved? By grace, through, and that not of yourselves. That's a gift from God. Faith comes by not your own effort, not your own bootstraps trying to make yourself believe something. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So the Word comes. Who opens your eyes? He does. Who's drawing you? He does. This is amazing stuff. And if you let this really grab your soul, grab your heart, the security and the love of the Father, Will, will ground you, and you will not be shaken. Because he never leaves, he never deserts, he never turns his back, he never walks out, ever. And it secures your soul in his love. And it will always produce a rest of soul. And it's out of that that everything else grows. Not works, but growth. Look at that. Jesus said, therefore, he said, do not murmur against yourself. Verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. As it is written in the prophets, they shall be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. So if someone says they believe in God and they don't come to Jesus and surrender to him, they're not speaking the truth. They've never listened to the Father. Not the God and Father of Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, the creator of all things. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who has come from God. He has seen the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, he believes in me, has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate man in the wilderness and they are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which comes down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore complained and quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will have no life in you. Whoever therefore eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. As your fathers ate manna and are dead, he who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said while he was in the synagogue um, as he taught in Capernaum. 
Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? And Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this. He said to them, does this offend you? What if then you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The word that I speak to you are their spirit and life, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I have, um, therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless the Father, um, unless it has been granted to him by my Father. From this time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. See, I believe very firmly that our hearts naturally, because of our nature, they're dark. And it permeates our entire life. And that when someone gets saved, it's entirely God's grace. It's because when before the foundation of the world, God who calls, he chose. That individual, he opens their heart. And I believe very firmly that when Jesus hung on the cross, he literally died for my sin. He just didn't die so that my salvation would become possible. When he hung there, he bore my sin in his body on the tree. He paid for me, for my sin. that when that gospel message came, it drew my heart irresistibly. It drew my heart irresistibly. I've heard so many other testimonies. Someone's in a meeting, the gospel's being preached. And they knew when that call was going to come. And if any of you want to receive Christ, I want you to stand up, come forward, and someone will be here to pray with you. And they said to themselves, I'm not going to stand up. I'm not going to stand up. And the next thing they found, they were walking down forward. Did that to them. What takes an atheist who walks in determined, I believe nothing, changes his heart without his permission. He draws him with irresistible grace. And I believe that But Jesus said that he'll lose none that the Father has given him. There's a perseverance that he places in the heart of his people that they'll keep on keeping on. They're not going to go back. Through whatever struggle, ups, downs they face, they're going to move forward and they put their trust in him. Now that spells out, you may not know it, that spells out a name of a flower called tulip. You ever heard that? T-U-L-I-P. Total depravity. My heart is dark. Unconditional election. It's God who chose me. Now, this is the hard one. I'm going to skip that one for the L. I'm going to skip that one. I'll come back to that in a moment. I'll tell you why. L-I, irresistible grace. P perseverance of the saints. Now, there is a word that, unfortunately, it, it's misconstrued often in our day. It's misunderstood. It's called limited atonement. Limited atonement. It, it means that when Jesus died, he died specifically for people's sins. Now, I want you to think about this. It's going to take your brain a little bit for a moment. When someone goes to hell... Why does someone go to hell? No. The Bible says the books will be opened and men will be judged according to their works. It's your sin. If your sin, if everyone's sin has been paid for, then when God judges, he would be wrong for judging twice something that's already been paid for. Double jeopardy, they call it. This is a hard teaching. 
But see, if I say that God paid for everyone specifically, then everyone would enter heaven. Would that not be the case? So then what they do is they turn and say, well, God didn't pay for anyone specifically. He just paid to make salvation possible for someone. But there's no guarantee as to who would be saved. Not actual. So really a better word would probably be actual atonement. But it doesn't spell tulip. So when he paid for you, he redeemed you. Why did you come to faith? Because he bought you. He paid for your sin. When we preach the gospel, we proclaim Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried. And he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. But if you've put your trust in Christ, it's because he paid for you. He bought you for himself. He paid specifically for your sin with his blood. Check the scriptures. You'll find it's a constant teaching. T, total depravity, unconditional election, meaning I had nothing to do with me. It was all God's choosing. Limited atonement, or um, I think they call it now particular redemption. That's another word that they use. Particularly, he bought you. Irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. I believe those. Those are called, um, it's, unfortunately, it's things have become isms in our day. It's called Calvinism in regards to the so sovereignty of God in regards to salvation. If you believe those, you're reformed in theology, even if you didn't know it. But you do that because you've read the Word and you know what the Scriptures teach. These are ones who died and lived or lived and died and proclaimed and it cost them so that you can live in freedom holding to the word of God itself. Are you saved tonight? Now I want you to hear something. What I don't want you to hear is this. Then I don't need to make any choice. <laughs> that That's a foreign concept. Because what happens is, is that your heart being enlightened by God's truth, repentance is never passive. So you turn to him and you call upon him and he'll save you. He'll save you with the strength of eternity and of divine power which no one else can overcome. He'll keep you for his very own. And if you stumble and fall, a righteous man falls seven times, and yet God lifts them up again. He says, come, my son, come, my daughter. Hear my voice and respond to me. And we come wantingly, willingly, and in a miracle of a heart change, how that happens, it's a mystery. It's like the wind blows which, which way it goes and which way it comes from, no one really understands. And so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Their heart ch changes. And I want to know Him. And they respond. It doesn't mean we become passive in our walk. Because we persevere. Saints persevere. They keep going. There's divine strength where they didn't know it came from. There's divine help when they didn't know it was possible. They, they, they find themselves uh, sometimes feeling this is too much for me. Even as Paul said, he says, I despaired even of life. But he kept going. Find that God was at work both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. All the way home. All the way home. He's my keeper. He has owned my soul. And I'm his possession. All of grace. You know who gets glory there? Him alone. 
I can't take the, the credit. It's him alone. For he was the one that was at work in me. And I fought forward with all his strength. These are reformed teachings. These guys are ones that you owe, in a sense, the, the gladness and thanks because they gave up so much in making sure that you could have it in your hands and you could freely hear the teaching of God's Word. Let's pray. Father, we just thank You that You are the God of heaven. You are the sovereign Lord. And we thank you that there's nothing that man can do, nothing the devil can do, nothing that angels can do to rock your throne. The earth is yours. All creation is yours. It's yours by divine right. And Lord, you are good. You are righteous. You are perfect in all your ways. And all your ways are just. We thank you tonight, Heavenly Father, that you who is the one that reigns over all things, that, Lord, you bring about our salvation in particular. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that when you hung there, you died for me. I thank you that you paid for my sin on that cross. I thank you that you opened my eyes in the day in which I believed. I thank you that you were working in my heart before that day. And thank you that by your spirit, you came to do that in me. And I thank you, Lord, that you changed my heart in such a way so that I would come to you and I wouldn't fight any longer, but I would surrender myself to you because you you are the sovereign one. You are the lover of my soul before I was ever even existing. And I thank you that there is divine strength, the work of your spirit, having been sealed until the day of redemption. And that, Lord, you will give me strength and continue to help me to continue on. And I thank you that that's the truth for all of your saints, all of those who have put their trust in you. And I ask, Lord, that you would strengthen them in your love tonight. I pray that, Lord, they may know that it is out of your divine grace, out of your divine pursuit, out of your divine love, that you have made them yours through the blood of your Son, that you raised him from the dead, and you have set him over us as the head to the body, as the husband to the wife, as the one to whom we belong. And we thank you tonight for that work that we have become the very bride of Christ, your body. And we worship you tonight. So strengthen us for the task. Strengthen us with, with might according to your glorious power in our inner man by your Spirit. That, Lord, we may know your love, its height and depth and width and length we might know this love that surpasses knowledge, that we would be filled with all the fullness of our God. And now unto Him who is able to do more than exceedingly and abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think, according to His power that's at work in us by Christ Jesus to all generations. That means all forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening. Please feel free to share this message with others, but we ask that you do not charge for or alter the content without permission. For more information, messages and contact details, please go to www.newhopecc.co.uk or download our app off the Apple and Android stores.